Amen. Amen. Can we say praise the Lord? Praise Amen. the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We'll open up with prayer. And immediately after we open up with prayer, we're going to get straight into our lesson. Y'all all right? Amen. Good, good. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you for being God. We thank you, God, for life, for health, and for strength. Thank you, God, for another day and another opportunity to enter to your gates with thanksgiving and to your courts with praise, to be able to open up your holy word and to be able to hear and learn from you. God, I know, God, that in me, God, dwells no good things, so I thank you for your Holy Spirit who makes all things new. We thank you, God, that you are going to uh, enlighten us, encourage us, enable us, instruct us in all things that flow from you on tonight. Now, great God in heaven, your people have come to learn from your word. I ask God you would speak to me, that you may speak through me, that I may be able to teach the truth of your word with clarity and the anointing. Bless your people. Bless each person under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all good? Everybody all right? Amen. Good to see you, Kevin. Man, it's a pleasure, man. I'm excited tonight. I knew it was going to be a good lesson. Let's see what we got. We're talking about fasting. And I uh, didn't want nobody to leave. So, <laughs> need be, we have, to, we have to lock some doors. When we're talking about kingdom commitment, and we've been talking about fasting. Last week we discussed, we brought about talking about fasting. And, Pastor, go to the next slide for me. So in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, we discuss what Jesus discussed, how we are to fast. Don't be like a hypocrite. Y'all remember that? Don't be like a hypocrite with a sad face, sad countenance. Woe is me. Hey, mother. Hey, bless one of God. Don't be like the hypocrites. But instead, when you fast, anoint your, your hair with oil, wash your face. That your father who sees you in secret may know that you're fasting and that he may reward you openly. Now, for those who can see, we discussed the three types of fast that you can do. A normal fast, which is water only. Water only, just drinking water. A partial fast, which is a dietary restriction. That's what we get, what we would call the Daniel fast. So instead of you eating your, your ribs, <laughs> your fried chicken, that good old cornbread. That mac with a lot of cheese. Instead of you eating that, you, you go on a dietary restriction. You, you're eating your fruits, your vegetables, your nuts, etc. And then lastly, you have the absolute fast, which means you are going to consume absolutely nothing. No food, no water, no juice, no drink, just ah. Physically. But well, throughout the process of your fasting, remember we discussed that you're supposed to be fasting and praying. Remember, if you are not eating but, but also not praying, you're just dieting. That's it, it's just a diet. It's not a fast. God gets no glory out of that. So you're supposed to be fasting and praying, which means you're supposed to be talking with God, talking to God throughout the whole duration of your fast. Now, we discussed that if you have medication that you have to take, you may not be able to do an absolute fast. You may not be able to do that. You may have to eat some food, and God understands that. God knows where each and every one of our levels are. Okay? Pastor, can you go to the next slide for me? Keep going. You may have made this thing fancy. Okay, so three things to expect when you're fasting. Suffering sanctifying and celebration. Both suffering and sanctifying are in the present tense. When you are fasting, you are going to suffer something. You will suffer something if you're fasting. And I want y'all to know something. If you're not suffering in your fast, and I'm not talking about a, a Holy Spirit-led fast, a Holy Spirit-driven fast. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a fast that you say, you know what, God, I want to get closer to you. Uh, God, only you can do this for me. And if you're not suffering, you have to ask yourself, God, am I truly surrendering and sacrificing these things that, uh, the things that I'm supposed to be surrendering and sacrificing? Because fasting is not designed by God to be fun. Fasting is not fun. Praying is not supposed to be fun. Studying is not supposed to be fun. Now, you can have fun in the process, but these things were not designed by God for fun. I know that's not exciting, 
I know that's not what you came to hear, but there are times in which you're going to be sacrificing unto God and you are going to suffer. Your flesh is going to go through. So if you're going to be fasting, that means you're going to be denying your physical flesh something that it desires or needs, food, water, etc., for spiritual nourishment. So as opposed to you feeding your physical body food, you'll be feeding your spirit man food. That's the word of God. And remember, we discussed this. When you fast, your spiritual pores are open. And I used Sister Vance as the example uh, two weeks ago because she was outside walking 100,000 miles. <laughs> that if you go outside and you run and get real hot and sweaty and come into a, a, a cold house, what's going to happen? You're going to get sick. It's a shock to your system. So it is in the spirit world. If you're fasting, your spiritual pores are open. So you don't need to be watching stuff that you ain't got no business watching. You don't need to be listening to ungodly things, watching ungodly things. You need to be filling your spirit with godliness, holiness, righteousness, the things that God appro approves of, the things that please God. That's important. And lastly, well, I can't go last. Sanctifying. Sanctifying is the holy process of being made into the likeness and image of God or Christ. So God, throughout the process of the fast, while you may be suffering in the flesh, you're being sanctified in the spirit. God is making you more holy. God is making you more like him. That's really why it's so tough. Because there are times when you want to break the fast. There are times when you want to turn the TV on. There are times when you want to cheat. And you want to negotiate with yourself, well, just a little bit. But instead, you surrender. And you continue to stay on your knees. Or you continue to stay in the word. You continue to, you continue to talk to God. And as you're doing that, he's making you more like him. Lastly, celebration. Celebration. That's when you're able to celebrate the victory that God has blessed you to achieve. Not just at the end of the fast, but also for something else that comes on later down the line. Go ahead to the next one, Pastor. All right. Fasting is essential for the growth of the believer. When we go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, you'll notice that Jesus says, when you fast, not if you fast. That means that Jesus was expecting us to fast. Let me give y'all an example of when and if. When I go home, I'm going to sleep. That means it's going to happen. That's When I go home, it it may be 2 o'clock in the morning. But when I go home, I'm going to sleep. First chance I get, I'm going to bed. If could be, I might get something to eat. I might not. It's a choice. Jesus is saying he's expecting us to fast. Regularly. That don't mean he's expecting you to fast like somebody else. So God does not want you doing an absolute fast because this person did an absolute fast. He doesn't want you doing a partial fast because that person did a partial fast. God wants you to do a fast unto him that's exclusively between you and him. Now, there are times we, as a church, we go on corporate fast. And we, we go through that together so we can strengthen and encourage each other in the process. All right? Deny your physical flesh what it desires while giving your spiritual man what it needs. Again, fasting is not meant to be fun. Next one, Pastor. Two reasons why we fast. Number one, to draw closer to God. According to Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, Mark 9, 29, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, we fast first, get closer to God, or because we need something that only fasting and prayer can obtain from the Lord. Now, number one should be the number one. If you're fasting, it should primarily be because you need to get closer to God. You want to get closer to God. And there's something in your flesh that's prohibiting that. And we all experience that. We all experience this wave or this, this influx of worldliness of some sort that, that kind of becomes our detriment in our relationship with God. And you have to fast and pray because you won't want that to be an impediment in your walk. I believe everybody here tonight wants to be closer to God. That's why you're here. So, you know, so my baby, JL, she came because she didn't have no choice. But one day she will. But right now she's a baby. She just came. But for the most of us, we came because we want to get closer to God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my brothers and sisters, fast. 
You really want to get close to God? Fast. Old folks said, turn the plate over. Turn the TV off. Don't consume the, the ungodly things, the worldly things. If you're going to consume anything, it has to be things of God. So you may, instead of watching your favorite television show, you may substitute that with sermon. Instead of listening to uh, 97.9, ain't that it's still on? I heard 102.1 was back. No? 92.1 is back. 92.1 is back. No? no, magic. It never left. It never left? <laughs> so what I am, I don't know. Anywho, you turn that off and you put it on ninety two point one, or you put you put it on something gospel centered, gospel oriented, because you want to consume as much of God as you possibly can. You may be fasting for a particular thing that only fasting and prayer can get rid of. Jesus says this kind of come out by nothing but fasting and prayer. There are certain things that are not going to come out of your life unless you fast and pray. There are certain spiritual strongholds that are not going to be broken unless you fast and pray. Unless you sacrifice your flesh, it's going to hold on to you. It'll hold on to your family. Now, God has blessed my wife and I throughout the course of our marriage to fast on countless occasions. But I remember one case where we were fasting for uh, a couple of married couples. And I want to tell y'all something. I like to eat. I like to eat. When I get a chance, I like to eat. I love to eat. It may not look like it, but I can put it away. I can put it away with the best of them. I could be in a food competition if I really wanted to. We were fasting for these married couples because they had some strongholds that were, they had some, some strongholds in their marriage that was keeping them bound. So my wife and I would give up food and intimacy for the sake of someone else and the strongholds in their life. And through the process of dealing with that, it didn't seem like things were changing. But through the course of time, God began to break off shackles, strongholds. And we are seeing those same marriages stronger than ever. Now, that's just one example. If I could, man, man I sit down with y'all and just give y'all a whole bed sheet full of story. But I want you to know that this kind of come out by nothing but fasting and praying. There's certain things that you have to let go of in order for God to show you that belongs to me. Next one, Pastor. All right. This is what we're going to be discussing tonight. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. When you get there, say amen. amen. Now, y'all do realize I'm not going to be the only one talking tonight. So if it's going to get real boring in here real quick if that's what y'all expect. Can I say this other word? Absolutely. I was in the military, and there are different weapons for different enemies. And so what you're describing, fasting, is equivalent to using a bazooka to bust the side of the mountain. <laughs> yes, sir. This is a little 32. Yes, sir. And, and, and so some there are some spiritual conditions, Elder Roy. The, the issue is not whether we're saved or not. Right. It's whether we are bringing sufficient ammunition Absolutely. to that battle or that fight or that issue. And many times, if we don't, Elder Roy, we're not going to see that thing released out, that our loved one is going to be able to get. Amen. So fasting brings the spiritual bazooka <laughs> to your situation. <laughs> There's some things y'all been shooting at by prayer, and it ain't going nowhere. Time to bring out the big guns, fasting and praying. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. When you get to say amen? Amen. 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 All right, so. Matthew chapter 4, I'm reading our New King James says, Then Jesus was led, was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Verse 8, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain 
and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Last verse, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. That's real good. Mm -hmm. That's real good. That's real good. Jesus, our example, is teaching us how to fast and how to engage through the word. Not just fasting, but he's showing us the, the essential qualities of the word of God. Verse 1. Oh, before I get to verse 1. Y'all see that? Say, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 is the essence of Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 teaches us that all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's all that's in this world. The, all, the best this world has to offer is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's all it's got. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. That's all the world has to offer. And in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, that's exactly what Jesus was, quote unquote, tempted with. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now let's read verse 1. Somebody read verse 1 for me. Matthew chapter 4. Somebody, anybody. Then Jesus was led up by the Thank Spirit. You into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So, who led Jesus? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. Now, I want y'all to know something. Even though the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness, Jesus is still going to fast in the process. This teaches us that fasting is an offensive weapon. This is Jesus going on the attack against the devil, going to where the devil's home or domain is. Instead of being in the garden, which represents heaven or God, he goes to the wilderness, which is the dry place. Where you, when you cast out devils and you send, them, you send them away, they go to dry places, the wilderness. So Jesus is going on the offensive, and he's going to fast in the process, teaching us that fasting is an offensive weapon, that we are to use this fast to go on the offensive against not just the enemy, but against our flesh. So the Spirit leads Jesus to the wilderness. To be tempted by the devil. Now that doesn't sound right at all. That doesn't sound right at all. But again, it's attack mode. He's going behind enemy lines on purpose. And when you fast, you are going behind enemy lines on purpose. But this is not covert. These are not covert ops. You're not sneaking when you do this. You're not, I'm going to fast in secret. I don't, I don't even want me or the devil to know. No, no, no. If there's something that's in me that don't belong in me, I'm fasting against that thing. I'm going on the attack. I'm going to deny my flesh. Self-gratification. So I can draw closer. Brother to, Joseph, just a minute. Because when you said we're not going covert, somebody may assume that means you tell everybody. Right, no ma'am. That's what you're saying? No ma'am, okay. no ma'am. That's what um, two weeks ago we were discussing what Jesus says. You know, that's between you and him. Don't be publicizing it. Don't be like those hypocrites with the sad countenance. Woe is me. It's between you and God. But you're not. But the devil knows that I'm going. To, he's, you're going against him. You're going against your own flesh. This is not something that you're secretly doing against yourself, so to speak. Or something that you're uh, you're openly going against your own flesh. Openly going against the devil. Openly defying him in your life. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Any other questions, comments, observations? Before we get into the nuts and the bolts of it. Could, could it be, oh Lord, that's why the church is so lacking of power? Because we're not using all of the, uh, the equipment or the resources God has given to us? Amen. 100%. That's, fasting is essential. Fasting is essential for the growth of the believer. Yes, ma'am? I, I, I just had a conversation with my grandson. I don't think, Pastor, that we are lacking in power. I think we don't even understand who we are, that we have the, this power in earth and death. I, I don't even think that, I think we think that we just like everybody else. You know, and so when we don't know who we are, the enemy 
is able to uh, take whatever he want to take. So if you don't know that you're the light of the world, then darkness will overcome you. But the Bible says darkness cannot overcome the light. But we think we we think we're mm -hmm. the same as the darkness. Yes, ma'am. But next, you know, we don't. So the, the lack of understanding brings about the lack of power. It's not that you don't have access to it. It's right. just that you don't. You don't know that you got yeah. it. So so here we are in a position where we're teaching about fasting, praying, and studying the word of God. Because as basic as they sound, they are essential to the power of God. Mm -hmm. Now notice in the text how long Jesus fasted, y'all. How long did it say in verse 1? 40 days and 40 How long? 40 minutes. No, not 40, 40 minutes. <laughs> 40 days and 40 nights. So what I want you to do is put yourself in Jesus' shoes. We, you know, we fast every Tuesday and Friday until three o'clock. Summer. Yeah, and we, I fasted today. 40 days and 40 nights. So I want you to picture how weak Jesus was. I testified a few weeks ago that God has blessed me to fast from one Sunday to a whole Sunday, no food, no water, and it was tough. But there ain't no 40 days and 40 nights. See, when you begin to fast again, you remember your mouth get dry, it gets clammy. Before you know it, your legs start getting tight, your, your, your bones get, get stiff, your, your, your muscles get achy, you, you get headaches, your stomach is all, they say your, your stomach is about to uh, eat you. It's just terrible. But imagine 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights, no food, no water in the wilderness. Who do you think he was communing with throughout that process? Father. The Father. So you see that prayer is essential to fasting, but he's also being consumed with the word because when you are fasting and denying yourself the, the, the physical food, you're going to need some spiritual sustenance. And that's what he's about to hit Satan with. But I want to put yourself in Jesus' sandals. 40 days, 40 nights. Yes, sir? What's the point of Yes, and I'm about to teach you that. So God bless you. Forty days and forty nights. Forty represents the the number forty represents trials, testings, tribulations, or triumph. And I'm about to break that down for you in a second. Trials, testings, tribulation, or triumph. The reason why Jesus fasted for forty days and forty nights because it was symbolic of when Israel wandered in the wilderness because of their disobedience and they had to experience some certain trials. So what Israel got wrong in the wilderness, Jesus is getting right in the wilderness. It represents the testing. The testing because God was also testing them to get that wrong right, but they continued to walk around in circles, the circle of, uh, uh, of disobedience because they wanted to do things their way. They complained, they got it wrong, they disobeyed God, they rebelled, they would wander in the wilderness. So Jesus used the number 40, 40 days and 40 nights to illustrate that he was wronging the rights of his people against the devil. Triumph, when Jesus Christ rose from the grave, he stayed on earth for 40 days. That symbolized the triumph, that this is no longer a bound nation. Anybody who's in him is now free, liberated, victorious. They can walk and live in victory. So fasting shows you how to accept and obtain the victory of God. Yeah, you've been taught today, huh? Look at it. I like that face. He only tried to go like that. Huh? <laughs> now, when you when you see that in the text that Jesus fasted forty days and forty nights, it wasn't again because he was just trying to look good. It had, it had a purpose behind it. He was suffering for us. He was putting himself to suffer in a, in a position to suffer for us that we may be able to suffer for him. To teach us that, look, if I went through it for you, surely you can go through it for me. And we go on our, our three-day fast. We just as comfortable. I mean, we sleep on good sheets. We turn the AC up or down. I'm, carpet? Pillows? Jesus is in the wilderness. Y'all want y'all know, ain't no houses in the wilderness. 
So when he does lay down, it's not a comfortable place. It's a barren place. It's a desolate place. He's, he's subject to everything that's outside. So it's real hot in the daytime, real cold at nighttime. Nevertheless, he's fasting and praying unto God. Verses 2 and 3. Somebody read that for me. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. Mm -hmm. And when the tempter came, came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Amen. So here we are. We see. 40 days, 40 nights, he's fasting, he's hungry, the tempter comes. He's, he's fasting, he's hungry, and the tempter comes. Now, when you read Luke, Luke says that the devil tempts him throughout the whole entirety of his fast. It's just right here we're getting the opportunity of seeing exactly what he said to Christ in the process of, that, of, the, of, the, of the fast. Which teaches us that when you're fasting, expect temptation. When you are denying your flesh, your physical man, what it desires or what it yearns for, even in food and water, what it needs, you can expect to be tempted. Don't think it not strange this fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. Pastor mentions it regularly. That when he when he's fasting, all of a sudden somebody say, You want some lunch? Yeah. <laughs> you know, man, I had I bought this and they gave me an extra. You want it? Like, of course I do. But no, I can't have it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for raising your hand this time. Thank you. I have a question because uh, being a part of women's word, I definitely have been through fast and all of that stuff, especially before we minister. Yes, ma'am. So um, I'm still learning as well because this last semester, I'm not going to lie, I really didn't take it serious. But the first time I did was probably really the hardest time. But mm. I really had a question. Why are we not supposed to tell people that we're fasting? Because What's the, meaning the, sole, the sole purpose is you're not publicizing it because it's intimate between you and the Lord. Right. Jesus says that you don't want to be a hypocrite. You don't want to be the person that's trying to go out and share, share the world that I'm fasting because you make yourself look more holier than what you are. Right. Okay. So what you do in secret, God will reward openly. Amen? Mm -hmm. Good question. Now back to you. Listen to this, uh, little brother. 40, again, the number of trials, testings, tribulation. Also triumph. It's also probation for the generation of a man. Israel in the wilderness, according to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3, went there for 40 years. Jonah, when he preached to Nineveh, said, In 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. Elijah fasted, and Elijah is also one who didn't taste death, was also taken up by God. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights as well. So these things, Jesus Christ is also showing that he is the fulfillment of all of these things. He's the fulfillment of, the dis, uh, of obedience when they were disobedient in the wilderness. He's the fulfillment of repentance as Jonah preached in Nineveh because they were supposed to repent. And he's, a greater, he's greater than Elijah the prophet. So he's the fulfillment of those things. Yes, ma'am. Now, what about Moses when he was up there for 40 days and he mm -hmm. actually got the law? Yes, ma'am. I, I was going to get there as well. I was going to get there as well. So... He is the word of God that came down, as opposed to Moses being the, 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 the shadow of that, the law. He is the fulfillment of that. Instead of Moses, Moses being able to use a veil to cover that, he is the, bright, the brightness of the glory of God. So Jesus is the word of God in flesh. Amen? Amen. Yes. I'm Amen. One more time. Which part? The last part. Jesus is the word of God in flesh. So his, his life. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he Mo. You can't contain Jesus as the light. Moses was able to put a veil over his face, and he still shined through. But Jesus is the total consummation of that which is light. Right. He is light. Y'all okay. read Matthew chapter seventeen. Okay. Y'all going not right now. Wait, homework. <laughs> but y'all see that the Bible said that it was his, he was he shined so bright that it was like no longer could ever. I thought God that was God, and that's why Moses. Just man, he, when he was on the mountaintop in Exodus, when he was on the mountain to get the law, he was in the presence of Christ. He was in the presence of God. When Moses came down, he was a, that was a foreshadow of Jesus coming down from the mountain to earth. The mountain represents heaven. Down coming down from the mountain represents earth. 
Moses was representing Christ, but now Christ is here. What did, didn't it say his face was all lit? It was, it was little. I'm trying to move forward. I got to talk about fasting. <laughs> I, let's see if we can be illogical. Ain't it good that y'all got a teacher? Y'all got some pastors that can teach you the scriptures? Uh, you can get off course and... Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to understand. I understand. Proverbs 4 and 7, and all you're getting, getting understanding. I'm with you. And, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the son of God, command that these stones be turned to bread. Notice that the devil is called the tempter. So anytime you are facing temptation to break your fast, you know it's the devil. Anytime you are facing temptation to break your fast, you know it's the tempter. It's the enticer. It's the one who wants to appease your flesh so you don't please God. It's the one who wants you to break your focus in the fast. To take a quick lapse and say, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. God understand. That's what, the, that's, what he's, that's what he's doing. Notice what he does. The tempter comes to Jesus. And if, oh, man. Can I do that? Pastor, can you go to the next one? Okay. There we go. I got it. Thank you, Lord. Verse 3 is what we see. Jesus being tempted with the lust of the flesh. Oh, yeah. The lust of the flesh. Verse 3 is where he's tempted with the lust of the flesh. He says, if you are the son of God, command that these stones be turned to bread because Jesus is hungry. So Jesus is hungry and the first thing he tempts Jesus with is that which he needs, what he wants. Food. If you're the son of God, command that these stones be turned to bread. In the place in which Jesus was uh, fasting in the wilderness, these little stones look like the bread of, that they used to eat in Israel. So it's like, yeah, you know you're hungry. <laughs> I heard your stomach way, <laughs> heard your stomach way over there. I mean, but if you who if you are who you say you are, go ahead and uh, obey me. If you are who you say you are, disobey him and obey me. No. Make me your God. That's what Satan's saying. Make me your God. Just my question. I, I, and I know a lot of times with men, and it could be true with women too, the way you get a man to do something, say, well, if you think you're all that, prove it. You know, the, and that's what mm -hmm. the devil, the devil knows our human oh, nature. Yeah. And so he not only knew he was hungry, but he knew how to say, well, if you, you know how we say, if you think you, if you, if you so and so, then yeah. show me, prove mm -hmm. it. And the first thing, if you in the flesh, the first thing you gonna do is, oh, okay, I show you, mm -hmm. you know, right, that's right. So here you and you see that this deals with God's provision. He wants God, He wants Jesus to do something supernatural to supersede God providing for Him. Mm. Do something supernatural and don't go through the the regimented process of humanity. You don't have to wait for God. You can get ahead of God. Say that. Amen. Go, go. Amen. I was gonna say, say that because although he's part of this triune, mm -hmm. there's still order there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now you trying to get you trying to get the Son to get out of order to discount the. Yeah. And you were there. You were there in the heavenly. Right. Yes, ma'am. Oh. And because we probably going this one. No, no, that's good. That's good. I don't, I, this is all according yeah. to the. Go ahead, Pastor. And, and, and he does what Sister Lyons and Dr. Brown said. He does this regularly. You don't have to wait for God to give you what He said He was going to give mm -hmm. you. You can get use it. your common sense mm -hmm. and get it now. Right. If God loves you so much, He's going to forgive you anyway. He understands. Mm -hmm. Ooh, preach that. And, and so <laughs> you, you're talking about discipline. You're talking about spiritual mm -hmm. order. And, 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 and we've been sharing with our congregation, Elder Leroy, the reason why the church doesn't have the power mm -hmm. that it needs to have because we're not in order. Right. No. And, and so that's when, when the little boy was demon-possessed. Mm -hmm. The father brought him to the disciples. Mm -hmm. There's an argument. They, they argue about who the greatest. They, they, who's the greatest? Mm -hmm. They're doing all this. And when we are not lined up as a church, Elder Lord, we cannot minister the Waller County effectively. Amen. That wow. There's things that we should not be trying to vote out. We ought to be casting. Amen. 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 There, there, there's situations that some of our 
members and children have, they appear to be, Elder Roy, uh, medical situations, or they appear to be mental situations, it's just demonic oppression. Yes, sir. And that demon has to be cast out. Amen. You, you, can't, you can't talk to him, Elder Roy. Right. He's got to be cast out. Amen. And so that's one of the fallacies of the church today. And, and, and I'll say this last thing, Elder Roy. Okay, the Christianity that you're talking about, you're talking about rolling up your sleeve, mm. getting on your bended knees, and fighting the enemy where he's battling. And most people don't want to do that, Elder Roy. Right. We yeah. want a convenient, comfortable, <laughs> Do what we right. want to do, because my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. I just do what I want to do, and I'll eventually know. He, he saves us, Elder Roy, mm -hmm. so that we can witness the gospel to people who are currently bound. Amen. Amen. And mind you, that's why I said put yourself in Jesus' shoes. He's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. This is, I, want, I really want you to get that. 40 days and 40 nights. And again, Luke says that the devil would like, tempt him every day. Every day. Every day. And on this 40th day, Jesus, I mean, I can I can only imagine how weak, how weary he, he may he may have been. I can only imagine. And yet the devil don't let up throughout this fast. Mm -hmm. So here we are with the opportunity of seeing what Christ does so we can do as well. Now check this out, y'all. The first temptation that the devil actually gives him is an actual temptation. Because he's hungry. He wants that food. He wants he want some bread. He's hungry. Verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, Jesus, when tempted during his fast, depended on Scripture. Jesus, when tempted, depended on scripture. I'm talking about through this fast because that's what the context is through the fast. But when you're tempted, even if it ain't a fast, you need scripture. So Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 accurately. He uses Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 as the sword to fight the devil. Now, oh wait, listen to this y'all. He's weak, 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water, but he got the word. He got everything he needs to fight the devil. So check this out. He says this, man shall not live by bread alone, teaching us that we do live by bread, but that's not the only thing we live by. And here's the beautiful thing about the word of God. It's always digestible. All of God's word is digestible. We can do God's word. You can't eat certain food. You don't even, you know, it ain't anybody you like it. Because sometimes you just can't eat certain food. You may be allergic to it. But ain't nobody allergic to God's word if you eat it. May not like it. May not like how it go down. It may taste sweet in your mouth and then get bitter in your stomach because you actually got to deal with it. But you can do that. Jesus is teaching us how to fight the devil the best way. Not our way, the best way. So though weak, 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water, weak, he still speaks the word. And Jesus shows us that his need for God's word exceeded his need for food. His need for God's word exceeded his need for food. His need for God's word exceeded his need for food. You're right. I have the power to turn these stones into bread, but I can't live by bread alone. I haven't been living by bread alone since these 40 days and 40 nights. What have I been living on? The word of God. That's The word of God will get you through some hardships. The word of God will get you through some hard situations. And, and I know we live in a generation where folks want a new word. I'm tired of hearing that. That same old word got the same power that it's had since God uttered it. There are times when I go through my fast, y'all, and, and I don't get headaches. I'm, you know, I'm pretty strong. God's blessed me. But, man, I get them headaches. I don't like how headaches feel. Because it makes me feel like I'm, you know, I don't feel like I'm a man no more. <laughs> My wife got to come lay hands. I'm like, get your hands on. 
<laughs> she freaking Lord feel him God stripping him. I don't want to be stripping him. I want my I want my own. But anywho, I, I go to I go to the same word that Jesus goes to. I go to Deuteronomy 83, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I go to I go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. That when Jesus told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. I skip to verse 10 and say, therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Every fast, when I get weak, I go to those same old scriptures and it gives me the same old strength that I need to get through this same old situation. You don't need a new word. Just depend on the word and God will get you through it. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yes, what the Holy Ghost gives you to speak, that's like power. That's like, it really does. <laughs> that is power. It really, it really does that's, do what. And that's what I said uh, two weeks ago, as well as last week. It's not that you, it's not, a, it's not a theoretical thing. It's not an intellectual thing. You have to submit and surrender to the word. You have to submit and surrender to the word. If you run, a, you run 10 miles and you sit down, that don't mean you're not going to be tired. What it does mean is you're going to get rest. You're going to get strength because you fall. You fall on something that can support you and sustain you until you get to where you need to be. That's what the word does. It gives you just what you need to get through what you need to get through. Now, Satan says, "If you are the son of God, command that these stones be turned into bread." That's an attempt. Jesus attacks him with the word of God. Nothing else. He never gives Satan his opinion. He never gives Satan how he feels. He doesn't even talk to God about it. He gives Satan directly what thus says the Lord. So when the enemy attempts to tease you or attempts to tempt you, you don't attempt to do nothing. You attack him with the word. So you have to have the right word for the right situation. You have to have the right word for the right situation, which takes us back to what we've been discuss discussing. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't study, when the devil attacks you, you won't have the right attack to attack back with. Okay. Verses 5 through 6. Somebody read that for me. God dog, y'all. Then the devil took him to the holy city, mm -hmm. Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off for the scriptures say. He will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. Hey Amen. I apologize. I, uh, I got the first one. The first one was the lust of the eyes. That dealt with provision. This one here is the lust of the flesh. This deals with protection. Notice what the devil does. The tempter does. He's identified now as the devil. He takes Jesus into the holy city, the holy city, and to the pinnacle of the temple. Je now, how he does it, doesn't explain it, but he does that. He takes Jesus to the, the, the furthest height and tells Jesus to commit suicide. Jump. He say, he's, takes him up, say jump, because you know, you're the son of God. And the angel's going to protect you. Then quoted the word. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Before I even get there, he just, he takes him up and say, jump. That's the lust of the flesh because he, he takes him up to the place uh, that the holy, the holy city. He know he he knows that Jesus is uh, uh holy. He, he knows that, that that Jerusalem, the holy city, is uh where, where Jesus absolutely wants to want to go and he want to be. Well, he knows that. Uh, but I want I, I got some breaking news for y'all. He he's tempting Jesus with something that Jesus don't want. No, no, not even that. I'm, I'm talking about as far as jumping off and being prideful, stuff like that. And I, we, we hear it all the time. The devil won't tempt you with nothing you don't want. That's not true. That's absolutely true. See, the thing is, the devil don't know all that you want until he tempts you. That's right. And then once you bite the bait, got him. You got him. He, Jesus didn't want this. Don't, Jesus don't care about that. Now, the fool, yes, because he's hungry. He's been fasting 40 days, 40 nights. He, we understand that. But the devil don't tempt you with everything you want. He's just going to throw some bait out there. You bite it, we got him. Boy, that, that's Another reason why it's so critically important when you are angry, not just to utter anything. Yes. Uh, Job 
Job said, the thing that I feared most has come upon me. Right. And so Job must have been going around. Uttering, saying, yes, sir. Man, this, this day got to come. This is, I can't keep on living in this prosperity. And so we have to be careful, Elder Lord, this, when we are in I'm going to bring it back to you. I'm going I'm to I'm bounce the ball back to you. And you know that that has to be the case simply because when Job would make an offering for his kids unless they sinned against God, clearly he was concerned about this day coming. Go ahead. No, that, that's what I want to say. So we, we just have to be careful when you are angry, when you are disappointed, mm -hmm. when you're flustered, what you say ought to honor God, oh Lord. Amen. That, that requires faith right there. Amen. It don't even look good, but God, I give you a praise. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you next Sunday, but I got my own Alex testimony now. But, hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. I'm looking for it too, Jack. Now, Sister Vita just told us that the devil quoted the word. Listen to what the devil says. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Wait, wait a minute. The devil quoted scripture out of context. The devil is quoting the word of God, but he left out the most important part of that scripture. So, because this is Bible study, right. let's turn to Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, shall we? I will say first one, get it wins, but I don't want no fights in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Psalm chapter 91, verses 11 and 12. Now, most of us are familiar with Psalm 91 and 1 because that's he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, you know, that's that's that's, that's good eating right there. Yeah. Eating good in the neighborhood. Can I read yes, sir, go ahead, Pastor. Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. Mm -hmm. For he shall give his angels charge over thee mm -hmm. to keep thee in all thy ways. Mm -hmm. They shall bear thee up in thy hands, lest Thou dash thy foot against the stone. Yes, sir. So when you see the part that he left out to keep you in all your ways, if you just read that in his by itself, it's like no matter what you do. But notice the very first verse. It's about dwelling in the presence of God. If you read verses 1 to verse 12, you will find out that it's not about all your ways. It's about all your ways on God. He's talking about to keep you in all your ways so you can continue to honor and obey God. But the devil will try to take that thing out of context and get you out of the will of God. And, and, and what I was going to say, go, go ahead, go ahead. Mr. Lord, is the devil is brilliant. The Absolutely. devil got a high IQ. Absolutely. He uses, he say, I guess Jesus, the first time when he quoted the word, I guess the devil said, oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see where we're going. Yeah, we're going to use the word. Mm -hmm. So the devil takes the word right. out of context mm -hmm. and give it to Jesus as if to say, oh, well, a lot of times we use the word out of context mm -hmm. yeah. and we think that we're doing what's right but that that's a that could be a, a temptation yes, in a way yes ma'am so that's why you have to really know god and have the holy spirit yes ma'am the, the devil uses the word and, and and my note misquoting the scripture is justification to sin for the unrighteous yeah. misquoting the scripture is a justification to sin to the unrighteous. To put this scripture, man, look, all sin falls short of the glory of God. Nobody perfect. We all sin, I'm coming to you, we all sin to saved by grace. It's a misquote of the word to justify sin. I'm coming to you and I've seen your hand pass as well. Now, Satan was implying that God is only trustworthy when he delivers us from our sufferings or our dangers. That's what he's telling Jesus. Jump off. You can... In other words, you can live recklessly. Hmm. You, don't have to follow. you don't have to obey God. You don't have to honor God. You don't have to live the life that God wants you to live. Live reckless. Live prodigal. Mm. Live a wasteful life. God got you. Now, with that being said, if you jump off, God's going to save you. Mm -hmm. If you put yourself in danger, God's going to keep you. So God is only trustworthy if he can deliver you out of your danger, if he can deliver you out of your suffering, and you don't have to go through nothing. As long as you don't have to go through, God is faithful. As long as you have to go through, you can trust God. But if you got to go through, mm -mm, you can't trust them. Go ahead, Sister Kat. I was just saying that 
that lets you know right there that if the devil can sit up there and it sounds like he's co you know quoting scripture right away, that just lets you know that that you can't. If not everybody can preach to you, mm -hmm. I, not everybody can pray for me as well. Same. Because I feel like you know some people, like I said, just like that, it could be the devil or somebody else, and and they're right here trying to put their hands over me and pray over me, and they sending in they sending me all the day mm -hmm. they negative spirit. So you have to be careful with who, who you listen to. Yep. Bob say lay hands on no man son. Go ahead, Pastor. I just want to say amen. Amen. <laughs> I, I got a few more minutes. I got nine minutes. It just changed. Verse 7. Jesus said to him, it is written again. Mm. <laughs> Jesus continues to say with the present tense formula, the scriptures. It is written again. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16 accurately. <laughs> because now he's trying to tempt him. Trying to get him to tempt God. And to put God in a position of uh, abandoning his principles. Right. Jesus said, look, you should not tempt the supreme master, your owner. The supreme ruler, your God. You don't, you don't test him. You don't tempt him. You obey him. Now, check this out, y'all. This is real good to me. When Jesus quoted this in Deuteronomy, the reason why Deuteronomy exists was because of the disobedience of the children of Israel in the wilderness. That's why Deuteronomy exists. So God has to get them in a position so they can understand if you continue on this way, you're going to live a way of wilderness. But if you continue on in my way, you'll live a life of freedom. So when Jesus quotes this, he's teaching, listen, just because you have the liberty to do it don't mean that it's legal. Just because you can do it don't mean you should do it. Yeah, he could. Jesus literally could have jumped, y'all. Yeah. But that would have been illegal. Because that wasn't God's will. That wasn't God's way. And he still 40 days and 40 nights fasting. Still quoting the word of God. Verses 8 and 9. Somebody read that for me. Next the devil took him to the sea. Yes. And he Amen. Now we finally get to the last one, the pride of life. We finally get to the pride of life. This, this is done with the promise of God. This is the pride of life. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This is about me now. This is about me. It's not, not about me jumping off and being protected. You know, because he jumped down and the angels come and see it. They sit there and make sure he get down safe. All people say, oh, that's the Messiah. The Messiah has come. But they were so warped. They were going to war. And, they, and then Jesus disappointed everybody. That's so, but now it's about the pride of life. He showed them all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. All the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. In other words, look at how people will look at you. It'll be all about you. And that's what we just got through discussing with Sister Vila and Sister Limas. That that was already his from the beginning. That belongs to God. The, pro the problem is... These kings and their glory don't compare to where he came from. Where he come from, those are king, that's a kingdom. That's glory. So what he was really offering Jesus was the dust. Was garbage. But that belonged to him anyway. So if you if you read Psalm chapter 2, verse 8, you'll find out that that was God's. That was already Jesus. Switch and bait. Go ahead. Switch and bait. Switch and bait. Fine. It, that's, the devil, the devil don't take no days off. We, I got a saying, ministry never stop, ministry never sleep, ministry never surrender. Because the devil don't. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say a lot of, and we call them kings. Uh, what do we call them, Joshua? Kings. You know, like if you're a, a president or a governor, you know, you got to have a king. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. 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 Give you more power, or make you more powerful if you gotta worship me. That's what when these uh, corporations bribe government officials, Absolutely. they're buying. You know, actually, what they're doing is they're saying, "Take this. I, I'm gonna send you and your wife on a vacation to Honolulu or whatever, but you're gonna have to worship me. You're gonna owe me something in return." Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so that, that, and they. 
And so many of them fall for it because they want that life. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. yes, ma so again, Jesus is how many days on this fast? 40 days, how many nights? 40. This is a full cycle. Full. Yeah, still being tempted. Still fasting, still committed, still dedicated to God. That's right, JL. I understand, baby. Now, I want y'all to know something, though. The devil only quotes the scripture once. Inaccurately, but he only quoted it once. You know, he don't like dealing with God too much. Like, if he got a reserve to go to the word of God, he's desperate. You know, he's known as a father of lies. So if he if he has to resort to dealing with truth, he's desperate. He don't want to mess with God too much. He can't deal. That's too, that's too much God. That's too much hope. That's too much light. He got he to gotta deal. So what he does, you know what? Let me get you up here. Let me show you all of this. Let me show you all of this. And I want you to know, while you're fasting, you still feel and you still see. But you still submit. You still submit to God. So he says, I'll give you all of this if you just fall down and worship me. Just give your all to me. Falling down and worshiping is not only a sign of surrender, but of service. In other words, I will give you all of this if you will start serving me. If you start, if you start being my subject, if you start being my son, if you start being my child, I'll give you all of this at the price of. Mm. Mm. If you dethrone yourself. If you would just abandon who you truly are. Mm. Now, Jesus would have did that, y'all. That man, he would have, he'd have valued creation over himself, creator. That, that man, he'd have valued temporary over eternal. That man, he'd have valued sin over holiness. Verses 10 through 11 say this, and then we'll get ready to close out. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. Y'all notice that Jesus didn't ask him politely. You see that, J.L.? He didn't say, Satan, stop. <laughs> Bless you. Stop. Stop, devil. Leave me alone. Away with you, Satan. 40 days. 40 nights. I want you to know the more he dealt with the word, the more power he got. The more he stayed with the word of God, the more he got strengthened. 40 days, 40 nights, he's weak. Each time he quoted the word, it's a period at the end. You know, it's written. Man, shall not live by bread alone. But every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, take him to a high end. Show him. Jump. It's written again. You shall not tell the Lord your God. Him only you shall serve. Oh, 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 oh. You, you still playing with me? You still playing with me? I'm, that word began to get me. The spirit started functioning me. And then, away with you, Satan. Mm, he's serious about that. Listen to what happens. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Now, the more he dealt with the word, the more his strength he got. But the moment it challenged who he worships, it got exclamative. Not expletive. He ain't cuss him out. But he did cast him out. He didn't cuss him. He cast him. With the word of God. Now check this out, y'all. Look, look, check. I don't know if y'all pay attention to this. When he says, away with you, Satan, the exclamation mark at the end, he said, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. When it gets to who you're going to worship, who you're going to serve, who you're going to surrender, you have to attack the devil back with the scripture. Because he's literally trying to get you to change your allegiance. He's saying, God is not your God. I am your God. Serve me. And we should take that personal to the degree we're attacking with the scripture. So, then the devil left him. Y'all see that? Yeah, he saw how serious he was. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now, we see that the devil was identified as the tempter, and, and, and then the devil, and then we see that his name is actually called Satan. The more that the devil begins to tempt you, he's going to reveal himself to you more and more and more. So Jesus quoted to him, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20, accurately. 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 He gave the appropriate scripture for the attack that the devil gave him. Now, Luke chapter 4, verse 13 says that the devil departed Jesus for 
season, opportune time, which means he's going to come back. And I want you to know that's going to happen to us. But that's why we fast, so we can get stronger. Our spirit connects with God's spirit, and he empowers us. He enables us to fulfill his word and his will, so we ain't got to fret what the devil going to do, because we have been surrendered unto God. Now, the angels minister to him. Check it out. Pastor, can you go to the last one? What's the last slide? That'll be it. The, the angels minister to him means that they served as a table waiter. They actually served Jesus. The angels came and fed Jesus. The angels came and aided Jesus. Okay. There we go. So three lessons that we get from this scripture in regards to our fasting. Number one, it teaches us that as Jesus was willing to suffer for us, we must be willing to suffer for him. Fasting is not fun. I know it. You ain't got to explain it to me. But if he was willing to do that for us, because notice that he could not rule until he succeeded in this area. He had to be able to partake in the same sufferings that we go through. Number two, fulfillment is at the end of a fast. Fulfillment is at the end of the fast. That's where you see the angels ministering to Jesus. So you're going to fast and you're going to suffer in the process. But remember, the suffering, sanctifying, and celebrating at the end. Fulfillment is at the end of the fast. And lastly, number three, you fight your flesh with the fast, but you fight the devil with the word. While Jesus is fasting, he's defeating his flesh. But when the devil attacks him, he defeats the devil with the word. So you fight your flesh with the fast, and you fight the devil with the word. I pray y'all been blessed. Good Put our hands together.